Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the Red Letter series. I know you, you probably thought I forgot about it. I didn't. We just went through a tremendous amount of computer problems. And uh, although we've got the computer issues resolved, uh, the internet is still extremely slow. And so it takes quite a bit of time to upload a video on the one a day series right now. We're uploading that every day and staying consistent and faithful with that, thank the Lord. Uh, but because it's on the book of Job, we're doing a book study edition of it as well so that people on the internet that may not be searching for something under the one a day, but may be looking for a video on, um, on the book of Job will be able to find it. And so it takes twice the time that it normally would, uh, for the one a day, which really cuts into the time that we have available for our other studies. But I am striving and working very hard to uh, get these videos out to you. Um, and so today we are uh, continuing our study on the Red Letter Series, as I stated. And we are going to begin chapter 18. And Jesus is going to talk about the greatest in the kingdom. Now, if you're familiar with the gospel story and the story of Jesus with his disciples, you know that there were many arguments among the disciples on who would be greatest. And it's interesting how many people are looking forward to getting to the kingdom and they are excited about all the reward that they're going to get. And I got to be honest with you, friends, I'm, I don't understand that because that's not what's in my spirit. That's not what's in my heart. I want to see Jesus. I want to see the one who died for me. I want to understand the story and all of its completeness and all of its fullness uh, what little my head can get around here is oh, so overwhelming that sometimes I can't even contain myself to contemplate the price that was paid and the reason for it. And so I don't want to condemn those or even make others feel guilty about looking forward to the reward of heaven, but that's simply not my motive. And um, it's nowhere in my heart. It's nowhere in my soul. Anything that is offered to me, is given unto me, uh, will be placed before my king because he's the only one that's worthy. And I truly mean that with all my heart. Um, I met someone the other day and, and the way that they explained heaven was like the way that we see Christmas here on earth. And, and they just can't wait for that morning to come when they can tear into all the presents and, and they can wear their, their crown so proudly. And I just don't see that. So... Um, we see these arguments among the disciples on who's going to be greatest, on who's going to sit beside the Lord uh, in the kingdom. And you see, this is the way that the, the rulership of this world works. But Jesus always responds differently, surprisingly differently. And he does so in this passage. So let's read together. And we're going to read down to verse 6. So we're at Matthew chapter 18 and, uh, and beginning at verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So we see the disciples have come to Jesus and says, who's, who's the greatest? Is it Moses? Is it Abraham? Is it Elijah? Will it be one of us? And so even though this may not be envy for material possessions, friends, it's still envy. It's spiritual envy. It's, it's spiritual pride. It's spiritual exaltation. And these things are wrong. They're just not proper. And so if these are in your heart, I would, I would strongly encourage you to go before the Lord and place yourself in a place of humility and see him in all of his glory and all of his goodness, all of his mercy, all of his lordship, all of his worthiness. And if you truly see a glimpse of that, you're going to see yourself so unworthy, so undeserving. And to be honest with you, isn't the message of the kingdom, I mean, the message here on earth is about loving others as ourselves. So why do we think we're going to get to the kingdom and we're going to just hoard all this stuff that's offered to us? I mean, what if we get to the kingdom and he offers me my crown and I turn and I give it to you? 
and you give your crown to, it would seem more to me to be that way than it would by the way most men think of it. But anyway, the disciples, they approach Jesus and they say, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you know that they're, they're thinking among themselves, he's going to pick one of us. Because even though I gave you examples of Abraham and Moses and others, they're specifically talking about between the 12. Who's going to be the greatest? Is it going to be Peter? Is it going to be John? Is it going to be Andrew? Who is it going to be? And listen to what Jesus says. He calls a little bitty child unto him, and he puts the child in the midst of them. And he says, verily or truly, I say unto you, except you be converted which simply means except you adopt another course, another way of thinking, and you do not become as little children, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must become as little children to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you're like me, when you first stop and think about children, you think about restless, you think about rebellious, you think about never satisfied. You think about selfish. I mean, these are the things that when we think about children, these are the characteristics that we would place upon them. But let's look at a few characteristics that may not come to our minds immediately up front because the position of the kingdom message is always about our potential, not where we start, but where we finish, not what we are, but what we become. And so Jesus says, unless you become like little children, you will never, it is absolutely impossible for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, humble yourself like a little child, for that person will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is basically saying the greatest in the kingdom is going to be the most despised or the most forgotten or the most rejected here on earth. It's not going to be some famous televangelist. It's not going to be someone who's traveled the world and told millions of people the gospel like Billy Graham. Friends, it's going to be the simple ones. And so let's look at those characteristics for just a moment that we see in a child that is what we must become if we are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we know that the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel that God is going to exchange our hearts from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh not going to change our hearts because God never takes what is evil and uses it for what is holy. He is totally going to rid us of that old, dark, black, hardened heart, and he's going to give us a tender heart of flesh. And what that means is that at one time when we were not submissive, when we were defiant, when we were rebellious, we are now submissive. Well, isn't a child submissive? I mean, a child may push its limits every once in a while to see what it can get by with, but when the hand of authority comes down strong, the child doesn't push the issue. The child takes its position as a child under the authority of the parent and submits itself to that authority. And that's what Jesus is saying. We must submit ourselves to God and his word. We must understand our position in the kingdom. We're not rulers and gods. We are slaves and servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, ready to hearken to his every command at the moment he bids us. Another characteristic we see in children is that they are teachable. Not only are they teachable, but they're hungry to be taught. They're at a stage in life where everything is new and fresh and they want to learn about everything. And so we too must be teachable. We, and, and what the Lord means by be teachable is we must be willing to abandon the things that we think we know, the things that we think are true, that have been handed down to us by tradition, by religion, by well-meaning people. But even though their intentions are right, their doctrine is wrong. And so as we read the word of God, we must be conformable to abandon the things that we think are true or we even want to be true and stand upon what the word of God teaches us. Another trait that we see in children is that of innocence. Now, what I mean by innocence isn't necessarily that they have yet to cross the line, but they are innocent in the way they see the world. They are loving, caring, and compassionate. You see, People become incompassionate, unkind, based upon the way they've been treated in this life. So the older we get, 
the crankier a lot of people get, the more bitter a lot of people become. But four and five year old children, they don't see color. They don't see race. They don't hold grudges against one another. They can literally get in a fight with one another and within 10 minutes be right back playing with the same exact toy that they were playing with before. And that's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to be very careful in holding grudges, allowing our memories to imprison relationships where we become unwilling to forgive others, and by not forgiving them, then we're not truly loving them. Now, if you'll think back before you were saved, these are some of the traits that you probably had before you met the Lord Jesus. You were selfish. You were defiant and rebellious. You were unteachable, and you certainly were not innocent. But at the moment of the new birth, God gives us a new heart And these are the characteristics that now lead and guide us, that consume and possess us. The last thing I'd like to point out that we see about children is that children are breakable. You see, a child is born with a spirit of rebellion. And we know from 1 Samuel that rebellion is the same as the sin of witchcraft. And so it is the parent's duty to break that spirit of rebellion in a child. And the reason that we have so many children running around today that are rebellious that backtalk their parents, that stand up in these colleges and dishonor and disrespect these speakers who are coming in to present an argument, to present their position on a specific topic, is because the parents haven't been doing their duties. They haven't been doing their job. They haven't trained the child up in the ways of God. They haven't broken that spirit of rebellion. You see, anybody that's been in the military knows this better than anyone else because that's the whole point of boot camp. You've got all these young men and women who come into boot camp on day one, defiant, rebellious, and unteachable. And by the time they leave boot camp eight weeks later, they are absolutely new creations. They're not the same men and women who arrived just two months earlier. Because the military works diligently in its purpose to break these young men and women so that they will submit to authority and they'll do everything that's commanded of them. And if you want to be honest, that's the same regimen that's needed throughout the homes and families of the world. And so we see that children need to be submissive, they need to be teachable, they need to be breakable, and they need to be innocent. And those are the same qualities that Jesus says it takes for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And without those qualities, we will not enter into the kingdom. But let's look back at, uh, at our text and let's pick up in verse five. Now it appears that Jesus has answered the question of the disciples, but now he's going to leave the topic of what it takes to enter into the kingdom and more specifically to answering the question of who will be the greatest in the kingdom. And he's going to talk about the frailty of the little ones. Now, this can be taken two ways, depending on how you read the text. It could be talking about literal children, how frail they are, how much they need us as adults to defend them and protect them, certainly not to harm them. But it could also be talking about little ones being young believers. And so the way that we could harm them would be through false doctrine, would be through misguided teaching. And there are theologians that approach this in both ways. And it would seem from this particular text that Jesus is talking about spiritual children. When you look at verse six, it says, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. So he's not talking about children in general. He's talking about these little ones who believe in me. Now, is he talking about physical children who believe in me? Or is he talking about those who have just come into the kingdom and they are babes in Christ? Well, he he points out those who believe in me. He says it was better for the one that does bring him harm that he were hanged about his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, regardless of which way you take this, it really isn't that important because it can be taken both ways and it should be taken both ways. It should be taken to represent physical young children, and it should be taken to represent spiritual children because there has been and is being much harm done to both sides. I mean, in America alone, we're approaching 70 million abortions. Friends, I don't know the numbers, but I don't think all the wars combined 
including Hitler and Stalin and the millions that were killed by them even come close to that number. That's the state of Texas times two. So if you were to drop a nuclear bomb on Texas and blow it off the face of the earth twice, that's how many people have been killed due to abortion and abortion laws. But think about all the babes in Christ that are being harmed and misguided by people like Joel Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, and the whole TBN network. And those are just four or five of the most popular. There are hundreds of false shepherds out there that are misleading and misteaching people. And Jesus said it would be better if you were to hang a millstone around their neck and throw them into the sea as opposed to what's coming to them. Their punishment will be harsh, friends, because unfortunately for many of them, they don't even realize they're being misguided. They put so much faith in their teacher that they're not checking out what they're being told. I hope that you don't do that on this ministry. I hope you check out what I say. I hope you question and go back to the Bible and study for yourself to see if what I'm telling you is the truth. Not only do I hope it, but I encourage it. Never place any man in the ultimate position as the voice of truth. Because as I said at the beginning of this video, our standard and our authority for truth is the word of God alone, friends. Nothing else, everything else falls short. So let's close by allowing me to ask you this question. You say that you've been born again. Do you have a teachable spirit? Or are you defiant against those who would point out your shortcomings? Are you innocent in the way you treat others? Or do your memories of mistreatment in the past affect the way that you treat people today? Are you merciful? Are you kind? Are you compassionate? Are you forgiving? Are you submissive to the God that you serve? And are you submissive to the people that he's placed in authority around you? If you're a child, this would be your parents, your aunts, your uncles, your Sunday school teachers, your teachers at school. If you're a wife, this would be your husband. If you're a husband, this could be your employer. This would also include the police department and the governments of the United States. Do you submit to the authorities of these people as long as they don't cross the line of Scripture? Or do you rebel against them? Do you puff your chest out and say, they're not going to tell me what to do. I'm not going to wear my seatbelt just because they tell me I have to wear my seatbelt. Friends, that's a spirit of rebellion. That's a spirit of the devil. And we better be very careful if we have that attitude. Well, I trust that these traits and characteristics that we've discussed in this time together possess you, lead you, and guide you in and through your life. Because as Jesus said, this is who we must become in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Without these traits, without these characteristics, without these attitudes, we will never enter into the kingdom of heaven, friends. Well, we're going to close there today. I'm so grateful that you're with us again. I pray the Lord Jesus will bless your walk. I pray that the Holy Spirit will work with you as a blacksmith works with his metals, that you will be beaten and bent shaped and forged into the image that God wants you to be and that you will become as little children in his eyes being made ready and fit for the kingdom when well, as he wills and until next time friends I truly love you and I'll see you on the next video